Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, okay so welcome to our website. Um, we're the Fractal Generators and um, we created a heart disease indicator for our machine learning model. So a little bit about our machine learning model is that it correlates specific features of an individual's health with their susceptibility to developing heart disease. And the main features that we focused on were age, smoking, uh, physical activity, sleep time, and alcohol drinking. And the goal that we set for our model was to have a 70% accuracy rate or higher um, with reduced false negatives and false positives. Passing it on to Minjin. Um, the reason we chose heart disease uh, dexas a detection was because heart diseases is one of the leading causes of death in the world. It is important to take proper steps to identify the symptoms and treat it before it becomes possibly fatal. Um, this is useful because further medical treatments can be pursued if the algorithm returns true. It can be used to sh show how to prevent heart diseases from being developed as prevention is better than curing. The model can be used as a method to predict general health and risk regardless if the person has or doesn't have heart disease. Those who are predicted to have heart disease can also have their medicine delivered to them sooner rather than later. Okay, and so for the EDA, we started out by um, getting information about the data. And so using the dot info method, we saw that column 11, which is diabetic, has 9,340 null values or empty values. And um, this deficiency in data was um, really important to recognize because a shortage in the data could have resulted in um, errors during the data pre-processing and could have actually led to less accurate predictions. And then going on to describing the data. So similar to the dot info method, the dot describe method is helpful when looking at our um, heart data set. And um, however, the dot describe method only works for numerical features. And so for in our case, it was the BMI, physical health, mental health, and sleep time. And uh, this is a histogram um, that correlates age and uh, heart disease. And so as you could see, age categories above the 60 to 64 years of age range uh, were more likely of developing heart disease compared to the age categories under 45 years of age. And the NIH, which is the National Institute on Aging, um, actually pu published an article stating that um, those aged above 65 um, were more prone to heart disease, strokes, heart failures, and other um, cardiovascular diseases um, compared to their younger counterparts. And so this just, uh, this histogram supports that claim and um, supports the scientific ideas that go to back it up. And um, the correlation between smoking and heart disease. So as you can see from this histogram, about 13% of smokers have heart disease, whereas only 6% of non-smokers have heart disease. And in the same article discussed earlier, the NIH encourages to quit smoking um, as the heart and arteries can continue to accelerate closer to the um, healthy rate if you quit smoking or you do not smoke. And so again, same with the age category heart um, disease visualization. Um, this visualization also um, agrees with uh, the science of, in the article. And then physical activity and heart disease. So this was the our group's first encounter with data imbalance. And data imbalance, in other words, is when there's a disproportionate amount of observations for each of the conditions within the histogram. And it led to this inconsistent result because if you think about it, you would, you know, you'd think that people that are more active uh, have a less likelihood of developing heart disease, but this histogram proves otherwise. So this is um, something that we had to fix later on um, in our machine learning, like when we were building our machine learning and modifying it. And then sleep time and heart disease. So this histogram 
did not turn out to be very helpful because as you can see, uh, the peak for heart disease cases was between seven and nine hours mostly. And um, the worldwide average number of hours of sleep is seven to nine hours. And so it didn't help as much. And we could therefore deduce that sleep time isn't um, an important factor when considering whether a person will develop heart disease or not. Okay, and then alcohol drinking and heart disease. So similar to the physical activity and heart disease visualization, um, this visualization also had a data imbalance. Um, and again, if you think about it, you would uh, think that people that don't drink alcohol or consume any alcohol are less likely to develop heart disease. But same thing here, you would, it's uh, the visualization proves otherwise. And so this was another visualization where we had to um, fix that data imbalance issue. And lastly, for the EDA, we created a heat map. And so um, as you can see, the orange and yellow shades um, indicate where there is greater correlation. And so physical health and difficulty walking were um, the, <clears throat> the most correlated features, um, as well as stroke, diabetes, physical health, and walking and difficulty walking with heart disease. And I will pass it on to Sharon. Oh, sorry, not Shira, Marine. So our next section, section was the modeling. Our group tested six models, and the first being random forest. We've heard about this from all of the previous groups, so I'll just briefly cover it. It's basically a model that uses decision trees that are uncorrelated with one another to make the most accurate decision. And then the next model is the naive Bayes model. Um, this is typically better suited for biased data sets like ours, as mentioned previously. And um, however, considering that it didn't work the best for our project, as Naive Bayes has a condition where it works best when it works with independent features, meaning that features that aren't directly correlated should work better. But as we can see in our heat map, we have correlated features. And the next is gradient boost. This type of boosting is good for dealing with bias. Similar to the random forest model, it creates decision trees. And a unique aspect of it is that it use, utilizes weak learners. And basically, each weak learner helps the next one to not repeat a mistake it made in the previous one. So it's similar, but it sometimes does create better and more accurate results than random forest. And then the next one is bagging. So short for bootstrap aggregating, this model uses decision trees also, and it also uses the ensemble learning method to avoid overfitting, which was also a big problem in our model. And this model, however, can experience a lot of bias in the result, and it can take a while to run. And the next is the rich classifier. For data sets that suffer from multicollinearity, such as ours, which basically means that Again, some of our features correlate with each other. Um, it created a pleasing result at first, and it's also advantageous in the way that its runtime wasn't nearly as long as all of the other models. However, our data set leans more on the categorical side rather than the numerical side. So uh, this model is better fit for regression, which wasn't fit for our data set. And then the last one is the multi-layer perceptron, also known as MLP. It's a neural network that in the, as you can see in the image, it, it's made up of an input layer, hidden layers, and an output layer. And this also worked sort of well because it works better for classification rather than regression, as in like not on the numerical side of things. And a problem with this model is that our data isn't linearly separable. So if you scroll down and look at this BMI versus heart disease chart, um, and you zoom in on the red part, it seems that it's conclusive in that the middle section is um, between 20 and 40 BMI. That's where the most heart disease is, but that's not the case here, as if you zoom in, it's actually overlapping the data. So this basically concludes that um, you can't separate our data as there is a very large imbalance. And once you go to like the very uh, uncommon, very high BMI, such as up to 100, 
like you would assume that people up there would have a higher risk of heart disease, but that's not what our data shows because there is such a large bias towards the like people who don't have heart disease versus the people who do. So this is why the MLP didn't work as well with our project and passing it off to Chirag for the evaluation. Yeah, so once we chose these six machine learning modules, we had to evaluate which one is the best overall. And we did this by looking at each model's accuracy, precision, recall, and F1 scores. So if you don't know, accuracy measures how many predictions the model about correct. Precision is the ratio of correct positive predictions to total predicted positives. Recall is very similar to precision in that it's the ratio of correct positive predictions to actual positives. And the F1 score is essentially just a combined score of precision and recall. But the important thing to know for all of these scores is that the higher they are, the better. So with this data in the table, we created these four graphs. So as you can see, the first one is accuracy. And so with all of our models, they have relatively high accuracy. However, the highest overall was gradient boosting. The next graph was F1 score. This one, again, the highest overall was clearly gradient boosting. The next graph was precision where similarly to F1, the highest was gradient boosting. And the last graph was recall. This graph was a bit closer between the models, but again, gradient boosting was the highest. So because gradient boosting was the highest in accuracy, F1, precision, and recall, we decided to use that for our final model. We then graphed, graphed out estimators versus accuracy. So here we were trying to maximize our accuracy as, as much as we could. And so we did this by tuning a parameter of gradient boosting called N estimators. Generally, the higher the amount of estimators, the higher the accuracy. But as you can see in this graph to the right, we actually found that if you set the estimators to just 50, we maximize the accuracy. So that's what we did. We then made this confusion matrix. And so if you don't know what a confusion matrix does is plot out what our model predicted a value to be versus what the actual value is. So for example, the top left corner, of the confusion matrix is where the model predicts that a patient doesn't have heart disease and it's correct, they don't. And so that's called a true negative. The top right is where the model predicts that a patient does have heart disease, but they actually don't. And that's called a false positive. And following that pattern, the bottom left is a, the bottom left is a false negative and the bottom right is a true positive. And if you remember at the start of this presentation, we said that we wanted to minimize the amount of false positives, which again is the top right corner of the confusion matrix. And we said this because it's especially important for us since our project deals with the medical field, because as you can imagine, it's a, it's a real big moral and ethical issue if our model tells somebody that they have a potentially fatal, fatal disease, even though they don't actually have one. And thankfully we were successful. And as you can see in the confusion matrix, have a very low number of false positives. And now I'm gonna pass it off to Minjay to close out the presentation. With this data, a better insight is provided on the common causes and features of heart diseases, therefore allowing scientists, doctors, and researchers to predict heart disease cases from earlier stages in its development in a patient. And there is a chance that it could actually save a patient's life due to this. However, there are multiple ways that we could work on this project in the future. This could include methods such as giving the model more time to train, collecting and giving the model more data for more accurate assumptions, and maybe experiment more with the parameters within the working model. And finally, we could reduce the data imbalance already shown in the project. Thank you. This is the Fractal Generators.